Hello, my name is Nicolaas and today I'm standing in front of my wife's bookshelf and this has everything to do with the game that I'm about to teach you. Today I will teach you how to set up and play Ex Libris, the revised edition, and I will also teach you how to set up, play and integrate the new Expanded Archives expansion into your base box. Ex Libris is published by Renegade Games and it's designed by Adam P. McIver. It's a game for one to four players, ages 14 and up, and it plays in about 45 minutes. With the expansion, you can add a fifth player and also two modules that you can include into your base game. We do have quite a lot to cover, so let's go to the table and I can show you how to play. Hello and welcome to my library. In Ex Libris, we are all owners of our own library, collecting rare and valuable books. The mayor of our town just announced that one of us can earn a seat in the council as the Grand Librarian. At the end of the game, the mayor's official inspector will judge each library and award this title to the librarian that has the best collection while taking into account the wishes and needs of the mayor and the people from your village. You want to have books for all tastes, but you want to stand out by collecting the most books of a category that you specialize in. The inspector will also look at the stability of your shelf and check if all books are placed in correct order and he will make sure that you don't have any banned books in your collection. To help you win this title, as a grand librarian, you can count on your assistance. They will help you together and shelf the books you need. There are two ways to play Ex Libris. There is a beginner mode and a standard mode. For your first games, it's recommended to play the beginner mode. Once you feel comfortable, you can try the standard mode. This mode gives you more options in your placement of the assistance. I'll explain this and the difference in setup a bit later in the video when I teach you the standard mode. After you know how the standard mode works, I will show you how to integrate the new expansion, Expanded Archives, into your game of Ex Libris. Both the standard and beginner mode follow the same round structure. Each round has four phases. A preparation phase, in which we will place out new locations for our assistants to visit. A placement phase, in which we will send our assistants to town to gather books and help us to put them on our shelf. After that, there's a resolution phase. During this phase, we will resolve all locations and take our assistance back. And we end the round with a cleanup phase, in which we prepare for a new round and we check to see if one or more players have triggered the final round. This will happen when a certain number of book cards have been shelved. Of course, we will take a look at each phase in detail during this rules explanation. But let's start by setting up the game for the beginner mode. In the box you will find four scoring reference tiles. You will place these in the center of the table and during the game these will help you to remember how to score points at the end of the game. You start with the alphabetical order and shelf stability card. And next to this one, you place the prominent work style, the band book style, and you finish this row by placing the categorical variety and library focus style next to it. Take the stack with the 18 location tiles and look for the diviner's hut location. This is the tile that's printed on both sides and you can also recognize it because it has the number one in the left top corner. Place this card underneath the row of reference tiles and you will start with this location in both the beginner mode and the standard mode. Shuffle the other 17 locations and place them in a face down stack nearby. Give this first player token to the player who most recently acquired the book. And then each player takes a library tile in the color of their choice and a set of three assistants in the same color. So if I were to choose the blue library card, I would also take the three blue assistants. In the box you will also find these four special assistants and their matching card, but for now you can place those back into the box. Now look for these six category cards. They all have the same back, 
but on the front they show you one of the six types of books that you can find in the game. You would shuffle this deck and you then place one card face up on the prominent book style and one on the banned book style. Then you deal one card face down to all players and place any leftover cards back into the box without revealing them. You now take a look at the category card that you received. This category will be your library's focus. Keep this card hidden by sliding it under your library tile. There's a place reserved for doing this on the right side of your library tile. Of course, during the game, you're allowed to look at your card at any time. The cards with these backs are the book cards. Shuffle these cards and deal 8 cards to each player. This will be their starting hand. Place the remaining cards in two roughly equal stacks near the reference tiles. This is the inspection form. It's an erasable board and the inspector will use it to calculate each player's score at the end of the game. On the front side of the board, he can write the scores for two to four players. And on the back side of the board, there's a special form for the solo game. So for now, we can place it off to the side because we will only use it at the end of the game. Let's first take a look at the book cards. There are 152 book cards in the game and each card shows you two to four books. Each one of these books belongs to one of the six book categories. You can recognize each category of book by the icon on the book card. These categories are Corrupted Codices, Fantastical Fictions, Historic Volumes, Monster Manuals, Reference Texts and Spell and Potion Books. All these categories are equally represented in the deck of book cards. Let's see what other information we can find on the book card. In the top left corner you can find a letter. This is the first letter of all the books on this card. As you can see, all the books on this card, their title starts with a C. Underneath the letter you see two numbers. The first number tells you the order the card falls in among all the cards that have the same letter. And the second number tells you how many book cards in total share the same letter. So in this case there are nine book cards that have books with the letter C. And this one should be the ninth in that collection. We will see how that matters when we shelve our books. On the left side of your home library tile you can see the reference bookmark. This tells you how many book cards of each letter that you can find in the entire deck. Underneath this info you see the books themselves and the color of the book will match the category above and each of the icons. Each book has a unique title that of course starts with the letter that you find on the book card. Each time that you collect books you might also get the opportunity to place them on your shelf. This is called shelving. When you get to shelve a book you must always follow these two rules. A new book card must be shelved orthogonally adjacent along an edge of the previously shelved card. So you are not allowed to shelf a book diagonally. The second rule states that your shelf may never be more than three horizontal rows tall. So this means since I now have three horizontal rows, I'm not allowed to add a card here because this would mean I have now four rows of cards. It's also not allowed to shelf a card between two already adjacent cards. So I'm not allowed to push this card in between the already previously placed cards. Now that you know these two basic shelving rules, I will use the rules reference tiles to teach you some more placement rules and scoring opportunities. The first rules reference tiles that we placed during the setup reminds us of two other things that you want to take into account when you shelve your books. The first thing you see on this tile is the alphabetical order. Visitors to your library will need to be able to quickly find the books they are looking for. So the inspector will check if all your books are ordered alphabetically and numerically. Any book cards that are out of order will be turned face down by the inspector. When he checks this, he starts on the top row, moving left 
to write from top to bottom. Any book card whose letter does not follow the previous book card's letter and numerical order will be flipped face down. When a card gets flipped face down, you will not be able to use the category icons on it to score your points. Let's take a look at this example. This is how my bookshelf looks at the end of the game. The inspector starts checking my bookshelf at the top left corner with the book card that has the letter A. The one that follows is a C card, so that's good. The next card is another C, but then the inspector notices that this is book card 4 of 9 and it follows card 9 of 9. This is not in numerical order because the 4 card should be placed before the 9 card. And since the inspector flips the card that doesn't follow the previous card, he would now flip this card. This means that you would no longer be able to use the icons on this card to score points, but the card does still count for the shelf stability bonus. You are however allowed to flip cards face down before the final inspection. So, if you really want to use the icons that are on this card, I could flip this card myself to restore the numerical order. The C card now just follows the A card, so this would be okay for the inspector. The second thing you see on this tile is the shelf stability. At the end of the game, you will earn a bonus for the largest rectangular group of cards in your bookshelf that includes cards on your bottom row. Every card in that group will earn you one point. A rectangle must be at least two cards tall and two cards wide. Flipped cards still count toward this stability bonus, so shelving a card out of order may be in your best interest if it helps you to score a larger rectangle. So, for example here, we now have a rectangle of 3 by 2, so this would score us 6 points. But if I was able during the game to place this card here, I would now score 9 points. And I could even place this card here. I know it is out of order. It's card D1 of 7 and it follows D2 of 7. It means it doesn't follow the previous card in numerical order. And I could flip this card myself or the inspector would flip it at the end of the game. I would lose the icons on the card to score goals. But since it still counts for the shell stability, it would also help me to score 9 points. One category in each game is determined to be the favorite type of book for that game. The card that you placed on the prominent work style during setup shows you what category this is. So in my game now, this would be the spells and potion books. At the end of the game, the player who has the most books of this category in his library will score 15 points. The second place earns you 9 points and the third place scores you 4 points. You can also find this on the tile itself. The banned book style shows you one category of books that is considered dangerous. And this category has been forbidden by the mayor of the city. At the end of the game, every book that you have of this category on your shelf will cause you to lose one point. And remember, you can recognize the card, so like here the monster manuals, by its icon. So you can already see that I have one, two, three, four books of this banned category. So this would mean that I receive minus four points at the end of the game. Now it's time to look at the last rules reference card. This one shows you how to score categorical variety and library focus. As a librarian, you want to have a great variety in your books to cater to the town's diverse population. It is in your best interest to make sure that your bookshelf isn't lacking any of the five non-banned categories. Because at the end of the game, the mayor will award you with three points for every book in your bookshelf of the category in which you have the least. Remember, banned books, like in this game the monster manuals, would not be considered for this goal. During setup, each librarian received a category card, and this is that card that you tucked underneath your library tile. And this is your library's focus. This is your chance to stand out from the crowd, because this is your specialization. At the end of the game, you will reveal this card, and you will earn two points for every book in your bookshelf that matches your focus. 
So in this case, I would receive two points for each of these historical volumes that I have in my library. So this would mean I get one, two, three, four times two. I would get eight points for this library focus. Now that you know how to score points and shelve your books, it's time to see how a round is played. Once you know how that works, I will show you an example of the endgame scoring. As mentioned during setup, each round consists of four phases. The preparation phase, the placement phase, the resolution phase and the cleanup phase. Let's start with the preparation phase. At the beginning of each round, the first player reveals new location tiles. You place them face up underneath your scoring reference tiles until there is one per player. Eventually, there will be two rows of location tiles. A topmost row with permanent locations and the row below it will have temporary locations. At the end of the round, you will see how a temporary location becomes a permanent location. Since this is the start of the game, we only have the temporary row. We already placed the Diviner's Hut in this temporary row during setup, so if you would be playing a three-player game, you would now add two more locations. Next, you check if any of the phase-up locations have preparation instructions in their upper right corner. This can be found on permanent or temporary locations. And you can recognize them by this symbol. It means that you have to place that amount of books on the right side of the card. If you're instructed to place more than one book tile, like here, I'm instructed to place three, you can place them partly on top of one another, so leaving the vital information visible for all players. So if I've placed these three cards like this, everybody can still see the letters, the numbers and all the categories. Now the time has come to put your assistants to work. You do this during the placement phase. Starting with the first player and going clockwise, players take turns placing one assistant at a time on an unoccupied space. This unoccupied space can be one of two things. You can place your assistant on a location tile. This can be a permanent tile or a temporary tile or on your own library tile. Let's start by placing an assistant on a location tile. If you look at any location tile, you will notice they all have the same anatomy. In the top left corner, you find the location number. You will need this number during the resolution phase and cleanup phase. Here, you find the name of the location and the type of effect that it provides. Any location tile will show you one of two possible location effect symbols. Location tiles with a lightning symbol have an instant effect. They also have a green banner and green colored assistant spaces. When you place an assistant on a tile with an instant effect, you will activate the effect of that location immediately. To do so, you follow the description that you find on the right side of the location tile. Above this description, you can find a summary of that effect. The second type of effect is a delayed effect. You can recognize it by this hourglass symbol and the red banner and the red colored assistant spaces. This effect will be activated during the resolution phase. During the preparation phase, you have already learned this symbol and it was the amount of books that you needed to place on the card during the preparation phase. In the bottom right corner, you can find this gnome symbol. If a location has this symbol, it means that you may use this location in a solo game. Our last stop on the location cards are these assistant spaces. When you place your assistant on a location, you place him on one of these unoccupied spaces. If you see this symbol above a space, it means that you are only allowed to go here with your assistant if you are playing a four player game. Another location that has special assistant spaces is the auction location tile. This is one of the locations with a delayed effect. And you notice that this location has four spaces with a number from one to four. Auction locations have restrictions on how many bidding assistants can be placed on this tile. For example, this tile shows you that the limit for this auction location tile is one bidding assistant. So I would be allowed to come here 
with one of my assistants and place it on the number two spot of this track. If a player places an assistant on a space, this limit now is reached. However, another player may place an assistant on this location as long as there is a free space with a higher number available. At that moment, that player places his assistant on that spot and returns the lower placed assistant to the other player. The returned assistant may be used again by that player. Of course, once an assistant has been placed on the number 4 spot, it can no longer be removed. I will show you how to resolve the effect in detail, but I can already tell you that the higher you place your assistant, the higher the cost will be to activate the effect. The second place you can go to with your assistant is your own library tile. On this tile you can see three assistant spaces. When you place your assistant on one of these spots, you can activate the instant effect shown by this lightning symbol on your library tile. In this case it means I'm allowed to draw one card from the deck or shelve one card, so I am allowed to put a card in my bookshelf. When the players have no more assistance left to place, we begin the resolution phase. During this phase, you will resolve all locations in numerical order. So you will always begin with the Diviner's Hut, because it has the number 1 in the top left corner. When resolving a location, you always follow these same steps. If the location has a delayed effect, you activate it now by following the description on the right side of the tile. Then you would discard any book cards that remain on the location. And as a last step, you would return all assistants on the location to their players. So for an instant location, this would just mean if there are no cards that are placed on the tile, I would now remove these assistants and give them back to the players. Now that you know how to place your assistants and how to activate these locations, I will show you a few examples of how these effects can play out during the game. Let's pretend that this is the shelf that I have right now. This is my hand of cards. I have my three assistants here and I am going to use them to activate these instant locations. Let's start with this one, the Ye Old Books one. If I come here with one of my assistants, I can place it on the tile and because it has this instant symbol, I will immediately perform the action that is found here on the right side of the card. It says, discard one book card to this location card area. If you would discard the card, you will discard it from your hand. So I would place one card in this area. Then I'm allowed to take a card from this location's card area and then I may shelve the newly acquired card. So I would be allowed to place that card directly into my bookshelf. The card that I left here now becomes part of this display and it might be picked up if another player visits this location. The wishing well reads, discard X book cards and then draw X plus one book cards. So maybe I'll discard two cards. I can place them in this discard pile and I may then draw from the deck X plus one. So I would now be allowed to draw three cards. You may then shelve one of the book cards that you've drawn. So now I would be allowed to place one of the cards into my bookshelf. I could choose to place them into my hand, but maybe I want to place this one over here. As we've seen, this delayed effect would now be resolved during the resolution phase. This is an auction tile, and this means that the winning bidder must discard cards equal to their bid space. So in my case, I'm on space number three, so I would now discard three cards from my hand. But then I'm allowed to take all book cards from this location's book card area, and I may shelf any or all of the newly acquired book cards. So maybe I want to place this card with the letter V before the W card, and I place the other cards in my hand. You can always find a summary of all the locations on this summary sheet that you find in your game box. The last phase in the round is the cleanup phase. In this phase, you take a look at all the cards that are in the temporary row. 
You then look at the number on each location and you move the location with the lowest number from the temporary row to the permanent row. This is the row above the temporary row. This location will now be available at the start of the next round until the end of the game. So after the first round, the diviner's hut will always be the location that you move to the permanent row because it has the number one. Next, place the remaining location tiles from this round aside and face up in a discard pile. If the location deck is ever empty, you would shuffle this discard pile to create a new face down stack of location tiles. To end this phase, you would remove any assistance from their spaces on the library cards and you check if one or more players have the required number of shelved cards in their bookshelf to trigger the final round. This is 18 cards in a two player game, 16 in a three player game and 14 in a four player game. This final round will be the last round of the game. At the end of the resolution phase of that round, someone is appointed the mayor's official inspector and he or she will take the scoreboard and follow the steps on the form to calculate the scores. It's very important to remind all players that before this inspection, all players may voluntarily flip any number of cards in their bookshelf in order to achieve a better end result. First, the inspector writes each player's name on the scoring form. Then we have three sections to score. Let's start with section A. The first thing we see is alphabetical order check. This means each player checks the bookshelf of the opponent to their right. Remember, you start with the left card in the top row, moving to the right across each row and ending here down in the bottom right corner. And you would flip any book card that doesn't follow the alphabetical and numerical order of the card before it. When all players have checked the alphabetical order and everything is okay, you can mark this box off on the form. In the categorical tally part of section A, you see the symbols for all the book categories. The inspector would now announce each category and then each player tells the inspector how many books of that type he has on his shelves. Once this is finished, we can now move to section B. We first find the shelf stability bonuses. As explained before, each player counts the largest rectangular group of cards in their bookshelf that includes cards on the bottom row. Every card in that group earns you one point and the minimum size must be two cards wide and two cards tall. So here for the orange player, this would mean that their largest rectangle could be this one. It could also be this one, but in both cases, this would give him or her six points. If he would have been able to place a card face down or face up in this spot, he would not have six points, but nine points. For the blue player, remember, this face down card still counts for the shell stability bonuses, so he would also score six points. In B2, we now reward Prominent Works Awards. The inspector circles the row in the Category Tally section that you can see on the Prominent Works reference tile. So in this case, it's the Spells and Potion category. The player who had the most of these prominent books is awarded 15 points. So in this case, the orange player has the most of the prominent books and would now receive 15 points the second place would receive 9 points. We do the same for the Assign Banned Books penalties. The inspector draws a zigzag line around the row for the category that matches the card that is placed on the banned book tiles during setup. In our case, it's the Monster Manuals. Each player gets a minus 1 penalty for each book that they have in this category. Orange and blue both had three books of the band category, so they would now get minus three points. Assess categorical variety bonuses. 
The inspector finds the category each player has the fewest books of. When he does this, he ignores the banned books category. He then multiplies that amount by 3 to determine their bonus. So in case of our orange player, the least category he has books of is this historical volumes. So we will now multiply this by 3, so he would receive 12 points. The blue player has only 2 books of the corrupted codices, so now he would receive 6 points. 2 times 3 points. This is the moment when each player reveals the card that they tucked underneath their board at the start of the game. This was their focus card. They score two points for every book that they have of that category. So, so for the orange player, their focus was corrupted codices. Let's take a look. They had five of those books, so they would now gain 10 points, two times five. The blue player had a focus for historic volumes. They had four historic volumes, so they would now gain eight points. Finally, the inspector will now add up all the scores in the B section. The player with the highest score wins, and in case of a tie, the player with the most books in their bookshelf wins. If you still would need some tiebreakers, you can find them on the bottom of your scoring form. Now that you know how to play and score the beginner mode of the game, we are ready to take a look at the standard mode. This mode adds four special assistants to the game. They each provide you with unique power exclusive to your assistant. This mode will increase the player interaction, strategy and difficulty. Let's see how we can integrate these components into your basic mode. The first change happens during setup. During setup, after each player took a library tile, they also take two matching assistants of the same color, but they leave the third assistant in the box. You would now draw one of the four special assistant cards and retrieve the assistant meeple that matches that card. Or you could also draft a special assistant. You would give all four specialist cards to the last player in turn order and he or she chooses a card and passes the cards to the player on their right. So the start player will be the last to pick a special assistant. You still have three assistants to play the game, but now one of them is a specialist that provides you with a unique ability. During the placement phase, you can place this specialist on any spot that you can go to with a normal assistant. And any game text that refers to an assistant also applies to the special assistant. Let's take a look at how we can activate each specialist's ability. Typically, the ability is activated while the specialist is performing an action. However, one of the four specialists has an ability that can activate outside of your turn. So, let's meet our special assistants and take a look at what makes them so unique. On each card, you can see their name, a picture of the assistant in the middle and on the bottom part of the card you can find their ability and the abilities timing icon. This timing icon will either be an infinity symbol or an exclamation mark. This infinity symbol represents an ongoing effect and you will be able to use this effect during specific actions in the game. The exclamation mark is the symbol for a reaction ability. This will trigger or activate when the ability's condition is met. On the back of each card, you have a detailed explanation of how to use their abilities. The first one is the mummy. As you can see, the mummy has the ongoing entomb ability. When you place him on a space that allows you to shelve a card, you may entomb it. This means that you place the book card either directly on top or underneath a previously shelved card. You then flip the bottom card face down, so its icons no longer count during scoring. You can only entomb one card underneath each card in your bookshelf. And at the end of the game, you get two points for each entombed card. So here, my mummy visits the bookseller. It reads, I can take one book card from this location's card area and I may shelve it. So. The mummy now allows me to take this card and I can choose to place it either on top or underneath 
an already shelved card. If I place it underneath, I would place it face down and it is now entombed. So at the end of the game, this entombed card would score me two points. This entombed card cannot trigger the final round and if the top card would be discarded for some reason, the entombed card is no longer considered entombed, but it stays face down. Next in line is the witch. She also has an ongoing ability and her ability is called Transmogrify. Anytime you acquire a book card with the witch and that card contains at least one banned book, you may activate this ability. You reveal a card from the deck and then you may take into your hand either the original book card or the one that you just revealed. So in this case, our witch visits the bookseller. There's only one card left, so she would now take it, but it shows you one of the banned books, the monster manual. This would activate her ability to now draw a card. And I would now be allowed to take either the new card that I draw from the deck or the card that I received from this location. So in this case, I might prefer to not take this one that I got here and to take this card. Taking means that I now place it into my hand and then to perform the last part of the witch's ability, I would now shelf the card that I don't keep face down. So I might place it here to create some shelf stability. The wizard has the levitate ongoing ability. When he shelves a card, you may activate the levitate ability. You would pick a direction, up, down, left or right, and then you shift any number of cards in your bookshelf that direction by one space. While you do this, your shelf may disconnect temporarily as long as it follows all shelving rules after you have added the new card. This new card must be placed adjacent to a shifted card. So if I place my wizard here, again on the bookseller location, I would now take this card and this allows me, this location, to take it and to shelve it. If I now activate the wizard's ability, I could perhaps move this row of cards one space and I chose to the right. This temporarily disconnects my bookshelf, but when I add my new card adjacent to the cards that I shifted, my bookshelf now applies to all placement rules, so this would be okay. The last special assistant is this gelatinous cube, and he is the only one who has a reaction ability. You use him as a normal assistant, but if you place him at a location, and that location is later during the round visited by another player's assistant, the gelatinous cube's absorb ability will be triggered and this happens before the other assistant can activate any location ability or effect. The opponent must give you a random book card from their hand and you may then shelve it or your opponent must allow you to perform both of your home actions. Before we move on to the expansion, I would like to show you two variants that you can use when playing Ex Libris. For a friendlier game with less conflict, you can choose to remove the auction house, the gambling den, the assistance guild and the tax collector location tiles from the game. And for a longer game, just increase the amount of shelved cards that a player must have to trigger the final round. For two players this would be 21 cards, for three players, 19, and for four players, the final round is triggered when somebody shelved 17 cards. Now on to the expansion. We will now take a detailed look at the new expansion for Ex Libris, and this is called the Expanded Archives. This expansion adds all the components for a fifth player, so you get a new library tile and three assistants in the matching color. We get four new locations that we will need when playing with these two new modules that we can find in the box. The first module is the job fair module. This will allow you to hire more special assistants. And the second module is the artifactorium module. This module adds a new type of card to the game and these are the artifact cards. In a moment we will take a look at all these modules in more detail 
but you can choose to add any one or both of these modules to your game. The game also provides you with a new inspection form. This adds the one new scoring possibility of the artifact cards to the form. And of course, there's now also a column for a fifth player. There's also a new location reference card that shows you the rules for the new locations. And it also explains to you how the auction location works and the diviner's hut. In the box you will also find these three new scoring reference tiles. You can use these instead of the ones from the base box. One side is identical to the reference tiles from the base box, but now shows you the 1 to 4 player count. And on the back you can see the 5 player icon, so you use this side of the reference tiles for a 5 player game. If you have an original version of the game from 2017, you don't need to worry. This expansion is fully compatible with that version of the game. You just have to make these changes. Replace your version of the Diviner's Hut with the new one from the box. So owners of the revised edition won't be needing this tile. You can replace the town board that was included in the 2017 version of the game by the four scoring reference tiles that show you the identical information. And of course, the option for a five player game. Let me show you how you can integrate these modules and how each of them works. To add the components for a fifth player to the game, you would change the following. First, take the new scoring reference tiles from the box. You start by placing the first tile from the base game because this one doesn't change. Now you take the three new tiles and instead of using the one to four player side, you flip them to the other side. So for this prominent work style, this is the same, but the scoring options are a little bit different. And then you will notice that when you flip the band book style to its five player side, that it doesn't include band books. So when you play the five player variant, you will not be playing with the band book style. You can, however, now score more points for the categorical variety. And when you flip this style to its five player side, you see that the library focus stays the same. When you include the special assistants in your five player game, you place all 15 special assistants and their minis on the table. You would, however, remove the witch special assistant from the game. She is not used in a five player game. You can also see this on the bottom of her card. When playing with five or less players, without using the artifacts module, you would also remove the Owl Collector Special Assistant. The gameplay for a five player game is the same as for the other player counts. During the final scoring, there are some differences. When bestowing prominent work awards, the first player now earns 15 points, second 10, third place earns you six points, and now the fourth place also scores you three points. And when awarding the variety bonuses, you earn four points for every book in your bookshelf of the category which you have the least of. If you want to integrate the job fair module into your game, you can do this in two ways. This module comes with 15 special assistant cards and their mini. Four of these are already in the revised edition of the base game. If you just want to add more variety to the specialists in the base game, you use all 15 cards and draft or randomly pick one to play with. Remember to remove the witch in a five player game and the owl collector if you don't use the artifacts module. However, with this expansion, you have an extra option to integrate these specialists into your game. To do this, you will also need the two locations that are unique to this module. These locations are the job fair location and the temp agency location. Now during setup, instead of immediately picking a special assistant as your third assistant, you start the game with three standard assistants as in the beginner mode. After placing the diviner's hut on the table, you take the job fair location numbered 1A and place it next to the hut. It now becomes a temporary location. When you take the stack with all the location tiles, you will also add the temp agency card to this stack and then shuffle it. You now shuffle the deck with all the special assistants and you place it 
portrait side up to the left of the job fair location tile. Place the special assistant meeples in a supply above the scoring reference tiles. During the first phase of the round, the preparation phase, deal a number of special assistant cards with the resume side up to the right of the job fair location tile. You can see how many you need to place on top of the card. So if you were playing a 3 to 4 player game, you would place two cards with their resume side up next to this job fair location. These will be the special assistants that you can hire during the round. The tile itself is an auction tile. This works the same as in the base game. It has the delayed effect symbol, which means it will be resolved during the resolution phase. During the placement phase, you can place an assistant on any available space. The number of assistants that you can place is limited by the number of available assistant cards. So, in a 3 to 4 player game, there can never be more than two assistants on the same time on this tile. If you would exceed this number by placing an assistant on a higher bid, remove the assistant on the lowest numbered spot and return it to its owner. He can then reuse it later during the round. Then during the resolution phase, the first winning bidder discards cards equal to their bid space and returns their bidding assistant to the supply. He then takes a special assistant card from the offer and places the corresponding mini assistant on an available space on an instant location or on a free home library space. And then you activate abilities and effects as normal. You then repeat this for the other winners in order and return any remaining cards to the bottom of the special assistant deck. During the cleanup phase for the first round, when you place the diviner's hut to the permanent location row, you will also move the job fair location to the permanent row because it also has the number one. This module also changes the moment that the final round is triggered. It is now 20 cards for a two player game, 18 cards for a three player game, 16 for a four player game and 14 cards for a five player game. The other tile that comes with this module is this temp agency location. When this tile becomes available during the game, you can now place an assistant on this tile and you would then retrieve the special assistant that matches the top card of the special assistant's deck. You may now immediately place it as though you control it and use its abilities. You control it for the rest of the round unless another player visits this location. Return this special assistant to the supply at the end of the resolution phase. Some of the new special assistants have a timing icon that you did not see in the base game. In the base game we already saw how the ongoing and reaction abilities are triggered. This icon is the on placement icon. This means that these effects are activated when a player visits a location with this assistant. For example, this bookworm assistant has the on placement ability called homework. When the bookworm is placed on a home action space, you may activate the homework ability and perform both home actions. Afterward, you may discard the card to do the homework action one additional time. You can find the specific rules for all assistants on the back of each card. And you can also look for an explanation of the four special assistants that are included in the base game in the explanation of the base game. Now it's time to move on to the next module. The Artifactorium module adds a new card type to the game, Artifacts. You can add these to your bookshelf and each artifact provides either a new scoring ability for the end of the game or a new special ongoing ability. These artifact cards follow the same basic shelving rules as books. And if an ability or an effect allows you to shelve a book card, you may instead shelf an artifact card from your hand. When you shelve them, they do not affect the alphabetical order of your book cards, but they do help you to score the shelf stability bonus just like a normal book card. When you use the special assistance while playing with this artifactorium module, don't forget that now you can also add the Owl Collector. To add this module to your game, 
you will also add these two new special locations. The Artifactorium location and the Black Market location. The Artifactorium location has a number 1B and is placed next to the Diviner's Hut during setup. The Black Market location is added to the stack of location tiles that you draw from during the game. During setup you would shuffle all the artifact cards and place them portrait side up to the left of the artifactorium tile. This is the artifact deck. Each round during the preparation phase you would deal a number of artifact cards ability side up to the right side of this artifactorium tile. You would deal two in a 1 to 3 player game and three in a 4 player game. Just like the job fair location this location is an auction tile. It has a delayed effect, which means that it will be resolved during the resolution phase. The maximum number of assistants that you can place on this location cannot exceed the number of available artifact cards. So in a three player game, like with any auction tile, you can only place an assistant on a higher numbered available space. And if the number of assistants is higher than allowed, you would remove the assistant from the lowest number and give it back to that player. Resolving the delayed effect on the auction tile happens again during the resolution phase. The winner now discards the number of cards equal to his space and then takes an artifact card. You may shelve it or you may place it into your hand. Then the other players that made a bit perform this action. When you have resolved this tile, any remaining cards would be placed back on the bottom of the artifact deck. When the black market tile enters play during the game, you can place an assistant on an available space to take the top card of the artifact card deck. There is also a special section on the inspection form where the inspector can now write your score for artifact cards. Let's take a look at some of these cards. They can have an extra scoring effect or abilities that you can use during the game. For example, this Phoenix Feather Quill will score you one victory point for each fantastical fiction book on cards adjacent to this artifact. This G card has one fantastical fiction and this W card has two fantastical fiction books, so that's three points. There are also some fantastical fiction books here, but these will not score because this is not adjacent. This automagical hammer allows me to once per turn, when I take the home action, also shelve a card from my hand. So if I come here, I can maybe draw a card from the deck. And then on top of that, I'm also allowed to shelve a card from my hand to my bookshelf. Just like with the job fair module, this module also changes the trigger for the final round. The last thing I want to show you is something special. This is a pack of cards that I bought for the game and these are bookends. You can use them when you use the Artifactorium module and you shuffle these into the deck of artifact cards. There are three sets of matching bookends and a matching set shares the same name and they all score in the same way. Let me show you how you shelve them into your bookshelf. Ideally, you place the A bookend before your A cards and your last one after the Z books. Because if you placed a card before the A bookend or after the Z bookend, this card would be flipped down at the end of the game. Each bookend scores you two victory points if you have one in your shelf. You gain six victory points if you would have a set of unmatching A and Z ends and you score 10 points if you have a matching set of bookends. This is all you need to know to set up and play Ex Libris and the expansion. If you like this video, please click the like and subscribe button. And if you want to see more, you can always follow MeepleCare on Facebook, Instagram and YouTube. This was MeepleCare, taking care of your Meeple needs.